Tonight, we welcome Amanda Stamper, burn boss and fire manager for the Nature Conservancy. Amanda started her career in fire management as a member of a 20-person hand crew in 1999. In 2001, after finishing her BA in philosophy at the U of O, she returned to fire management, working on hotshot crews, hand crews, and engines as a fuels technician on the Deschutes National Forest and assistant fire management officer in fuels management on the Ochico National Forest and Crooked River National Grasslands. She studied natural resources at Oregon State University and completed a master's in natural resources, fire ecology and management at the University of Idaho in 2012. <coughs> she has since worked for the Prineville Bureau of Land Management as a natural resource specialist coordinating post-fire emergency stabilization and rehabilitation as invasives program manager for Deschutes and Ochico National Forest and Crooked River National Grassland and is the founder and chair of the Oregon Prescribed Fire Council and fire manager for Nature Conservancy in Oregon and Washington. Her talk this evening will discuss the challenges facing fire managers as climate change continues to impact weather and environmental conditions that contribute to wildfires, such as those experienced across the Pacific Northwest last summer. With challenges come opportunities to work collaboratively across all landscapes and make meaningful progress toward developing resilient landscapes, fire adapted communities, and safe and effective wildfire response. Workforce diversification and development is essential to making progress towards these goals and includes experiential live fire training, prescribed fire councils, and collaborative partnerships. And with that, we welcome Amanda for the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Um, it's great to see you all here. Thanks for both coming out to support the local watershed council um, these councils are super important in getting a lot of important restoration work done. And um, so thanks for coming out for that. And also to come and um, explore some topics that are um, near and dear to my heart um, with regards to wildfires, climate change, prescribed fire, um, all the challenges we face and what we can do um, with the opportunities that come with these challenges. So I'm going to get started. Um, what I like to start with is um, a disclaimer. Um, I use this slide because there's a, s a ton of science here, um, but how can we really think our way through this slide? Um, it's insane. There's no way to really think our way through it. So uh, the preamble is ecosystems are not only more complex than we think, they're more complex than we can think. So you take that same slide, now you apply fire to it. How can we possibly wrap our heads around that? So there's going to be a lot of um, maybe what you would consider to be uh, minimizing of things or, or uh, simplifying for the sake of our understanding because we can't even quite understand what this is. So that's one of my, um, my preambles to my talk. So let's simplify things a little bit. I introduced the fire triangle earlier, and now I'm going to introduce the fire behavior triangle. Um, so that includes topography, that's the landscape on which a fire moves, the weather that influences it, and the fuels. And when you look at this triangle, I encourage you to think about the things that we can control and the things that we cannot control. Also think about the things that change quickly in time and the things that take a long time to change. So topography, clearly something that doesn't change too quickly, usually, although there are some exceptions to that but weather and fuels and weather and climate being intimately tied here, so that's important to remember. Those are the things we actually have some control over. But let's add to that triangle and attend to a little more of that complexity. So we see that um, with the weather and the topography and the fuels and you add climate change to this picture, we've got all kinds of things that happen. Um, fine fuel loadings are associated with climate change for multiple reasons. But primarily, we're talking about rain rather than snow. So when you get precip in the form of rain, you get a lot of grass that grows as a result. So that's why high fine fuel loading is on there. But you also see increased dead fuel loading. Um, if we can all, and I'm going to ask you guys to do this again during this talk, go back in time and think about what happened during the winter of 2016-2017. Um, we had 
a relatively a large increase in uh, dead fuel loadings because of all the storms we had. We had ice, we had wind, we had stuff that brought things from the canopy down to the surface. And surface is where fires propagate from. So when you take stuff out of the canopy, you put it on the ground and you dry it out, it will become receptive and then that contributes to fire spread. So that's why I put that up there. But then you also see hot, hot dry summers which are also associated with climate change. In fact, what most people think about when they think of climate change, you get more wind, you get more lightning, um, earlier snow melt, and the fires burn hotter because the fuels are drier. So when we think about the fire beha behavior triangle and how it interacts with climate change, again, get back to thinking about those things that are really uh, changing temporarily in a shorter time frame rather as opposed to uh, topography, which takes a long time to change with the exception of landslides and some of those sorts of rare events. Um, so this is taken from some research that shows um, essentially the period of time since active fire suppression. So fires of 1910 were devastating in the Northern Rockies. Um, entire town burned down, a lot of people died. Um, huge amount of fire on the landscape that was not experienced by those who colonized this landscape. They had not experienced that yet. Um, and so there was a huge reaction to that. Um, a lot of policies came into play that um, essentially mandated that we put out all fires at all costs. Well, we kind of got fooled into thinking we were really successful at putting out fires because we also had a time frame when the climate was cool and wet. And, and that's how climate works. It goes through oscillations, right? That's why we call it the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. That's one of those oscillations that occurs. But there are also lo longer term trends in that direction of warming and drying. Um, so what we're seeing here is that during the time of active fire suppression, we had climate in our favor. And so that gave us a sense of being very successful about putting out fires. We thought we were really, really good. And we were, but then we started failing. And you see that as we see the, the, the size of hectares burn um, in the last century, which is from the, the mid 80s on, as you guys learned in trivia, we see this warm dry period that's favoring that large fire growth. And we are not having the same success that we used to have. So the average number of wildfires per year, and this wildfires, large fires being defined as those larger than 1,000 acres, we see basically increasing by about 100% from 1980 till 2012, and that's not projecting out into the future. So our fire season's longer um, by two months on average, and fires are getting bigger. And this is measured looking more like that, not predicting as much. Um, what this graphic shows is, as we also learned, that um, average annual temperatures in the western U.S. have increased by about 1.9 degrees Fahrenheit since 1970. Uh, snowpack is melting up to four weeks sooner than in, in previous decades. And the forests are drier, and they're drier for a longer period of time, which means they're more receptive to fire more of the year. So essentially, we've got fuel conditions and weather conditions that are aligned to really promote the ignitions and spread of wildfires. So this um, slide shows all of the different components of fuels that contribute to fire behavior. This is a really old school slide from early, early attempts to try to make sense of all of this. And I put blue arrows next to all the things that I think are affected by climate change. But actually, I just read a report yesterday where I put another blue arrow up at compactness. And the reason for that is because snow melt makes grass go down to the ground. And when there's not enough snow melt, it's aerated. And arrangement of fuels and vertical arrangement is significant in whether or not fuels burn. So it turns out compactness is also affected, which means the only thing that's not is chemical content. And I bet you someone out there has done some research to show chemical content be being affected by climate change. I just haven't found that yet. So I challenge you all to look into that further. Now we're gonna have to be patient here for a second because this is a data visualization showing, and it, it's a little dark at first, but this is gonna show you guys the global temperature change from 1850 to 2016. Now that to me is kind of crazy at the end, that spiral, where's it gonna go from there? 
Where did it go last year? It went up more, and it's going to probably do that again this year and next year and next year. So things are getting warmer, things are getting drier, and I like this because it's a different way to visualize the data. A lot of the visualizations just show graphs, but this shows like a spiral, like it's spiraling out of control. It's not just on an upward trend, it's really spiraling out of control. So what does that mean for us? One of the beauties of Science Club is I get to drink beer while I talk. <laughs> it, it might get more fun as it goes. All right, so what happened last year? Well, not what we expected, that's for sure, seriously. Um, and I want you to just look at this because look at where all these spires are. They're on the west side of the Cascades. How could that possibly happen in a year like last year? I mean, look at this. We had up to 140% of our snow water equivalent as of March 31st. That's fairly late. The negative 997, I don't know where that came from. Don't worry about that. The rest of the numbers are telling the stories that we had either at or way above our snow water equivalent. L now, this isn't last winter, but the winter before. So we're going back in time. We'll catch up here, and I'll tell you more about this season. Um, but we got to look at the past to understand the present and the future. So here we are. We're thinking, sweet, we're out of drought. We got a bunch of moisture. It's going to be, I'm not going to worry about fires this year. And sure enough, the summary shows that we had lower than average temps for most of the Pacific Northwest. We had wetter than typical for the West Coast, especially Southwest Oregon, California, and the Great Basin. So this was from October 2016 through March 2017. Here we have 137% of our average snowpack at Crater Lake. And this was in April. This is how much snow we had there. This is our significant wildland fire potential outlook for June and July of 2017. Hardly anything. July. All of the West, except the only place was showing any significant potential was down in uh, the Southwest. Is this what really happened? Do you guys remember last summer how smoky it was? This isn't what happened, is it? This is what happened. So the energy release component is a number that's related to, related to the available energy in BTUs. Um, that's per unit area in square feet in the flaming front of a head fire. And so we, this is a very important metric for us in wildland fire management because it tells us how much, it's basically that power of the fire. It's not just how fast it burns or how long the flame lengths are, but it's like how much energy is that really going to release? How much of that energy stored in the plant is it going to transform into BTUs, right? Okay, now if I had a little laser pointer, I'd point up and down here, but I'm going to use my finger. Look down there, you know, mid-June. We had, and actually even before that, pretty low, and this is from 73 remote automated weather stations across the Pacific Northwest. So they averaged all the information from those stations. And those stations, some of them are collecting data for like 40 years. So they have been averaging this amount of data for that long. And we are seeing that by August and even by mid-July, we're setting records for energy release component. So that's insane that we had a, a, wet, a year that wet that we thought we were out of the woods, and this is where we ended up, where we had wildland fire potential outlooks that said, we're not going to see big fires this year, and then here we had this, and we had fires for sure. Again, same thing for the east side um, specifically. This is taking... Um, the data from Lava Butte, Colgate, and Cabin Lake, which are raw stations on the east side of the Cascades, and averaging those out, and you see lowest ever measured and highest ever measured in the same year. In the same year, lowest and highest. That's what's starting to happen out there. Um, energy release component at Trout Creek, which is a raw station that is up on, um, it's where the Jones Fire was located at Fall Creek. That fire was burning um, last summer, and so we were using this to do some of our analysis. The lowest ERCs ever at zero and record setting. Similarly, 1,000-hour fuel moistures, which is the, m the moisture in um, dead fuels on the ground that are anywhere from 3 to 9 inches in diameter. Highest ever recorded, lowest ever recorded, same seasons. So here's what actually happened by September. 
Um, we had significant wildfire potential all over the place. And you don't go from the first slide I showed you to this without a huge recalibration. And that's what's happening. Like every fire almost, it's a recalibration because we're seeing new things happen that haven't been seen before. So now we're going to look at where we're at and where we're headed. Um, for May, when they um, did the outlook for May, they were predicting equal chances for about a little over half the state and a little bit of an above average potential. And what was seen was that we had warmer than average for May across the Pacific Northwest. So it was warmer than we thought it was going to be. Expect the unexpected. And the same thing um, for precipitation, although they nailed it a little better in saying that we were going to have below um, average precipitation and it was quite a bit below. So everything's warmer and everything's drier, I guess, is the take home. More so than we expected. Our anomalies since October 1st, both for temp and precip, same story. Um, largely are showing at or above normal, the coast being an exception, and um, below normal precip, and below normal by a lot, meaning there are places that are at 0% of snow water equivalent for this part of the year, um, primarily in south central Oregon. Um, but no part of the state at this point is at what we call normal for this time of year. The closest we have is up on the Columbia River Gorge at 84%. But these are pretty dire numbers um, when you're looking at uh, precip. So very poor snowpack this year. Now that there's ups and downs here. Typically when we get less snowpack, we also have less ignitions from lightning because lightning is more frequent when we have higher snowpack, but then it heats up and melts really quickly. So we'll see. The drought monitor as of May 31st is showing that we have both um, short and long-term drought impacts. Um, that is primarily in the same parts of the state where we see 0% of snow water equivalent. So that's pretty much correlated there. And we see that that is expected to persist uh, through August. So we're not expecting relief. We're expecting things to remain warm and dry. Um, seasonal temperature and precipitation outlook. These will be verified too. That's one of the things that's great about the Northwest Coordination Center Predictive Services. Is they produce these outlooks every month and then they validate their outlook the following month to show where they were correct and where they were off. So it's supposed to be warm and dry through September. And this is running through our outlook. So June shows a lot worse of a situation this year than last year, but then it just gets worse from there. Now, I th this is just a kind of a interesting point if y'all don't know. You see all that red down in the southeast or the southwest? You'd think it would just keep getting worse all summer, right? No, they have monsoons, and those usually hit in like mid-July. And so that's why all of a sudden, July, they're no longer on the map because they get monsoonal moisture, and that puts out their fire for the remainder of the season. And then the rest of us get to have all our fire for the rest of the year. All right, so I'm switching gears here a little bit, um, talking about fire in particularly Pacific Northwest. So this is a map, a very simplified map of uh, fire ecoregions and forested fire regime groups. Um, the one means uh, fire frequent. So it means it could be annual fire return interval. It could be every 15 years. It could be every 30 years. But it's on a low intensity, uh, high frequency regime. So that's the kind of forest where it basically gets cleansed on a very regular basis by fire. And the overstory plants are highly resistant to any kind of effects from it. So they tend to thrive because of fire, reducing competition from other uh, brush and small trees. Then you get into number three, and that's more of a mixed regime. It can be um, fairly low frequency, high severity effects where the stand gets nuked pretty much and then it grows back. But usually it's more mixed. There's a pocket of that and a pocket of more of the uh, low severity, high frequency. And then then you get into what we call fire regimes four and five, so either on the coast range or at the crest of the Cascades. Um, these are standard placing regimes, which means that um, they start over completely and um, don't really have any of the mixed effects between the low and the high severity. 
And this is very simplified. Now, something to note, you'll see all these gray areas that don't have anything in there. Well, because those are not considered forested areas, they're grasslands, and um, they have much more nuanced return intervals. So in the Willamette Valley, it's on the order of three to five years. Um, the grasslands of the, of the Great Basin and the Columbia Plateau, um, they can vary considerably. In fact, some of those areas are seeing way too much fire uh, because of annual grass invasions, and that's kind of another story, but that's the explanation behind why you don't see the fire regimes included there. So I'm going to go through a series of graphics. Um, they're uh, based on the work of Van Pelt. Um, if any of you are familiar with Van Pelt, he does visualization of stand conditions relative to disturbance. So I'm going to show you um, how the, ro the natural role of fire and what happens um, with and without it. So let's just start at zero, year zero in a place that has been maintained by fire or a surrogate disturbance of some kind and is in, you know, not out of whack. So here we are at year zero, fire burns at year 20, year 40, this is what it looks like. It's changed obviously, but not by a whole lot. Year 60 gets another fire, that's what it looks like at year 80. So with frequent fire, you maintain very similar stand to conditions to what you start with. If you take that same situation and you do not allow the disturbance of fire to do its work, you end up with choked conditions, thick stands. And so the question is, do we want to restore and maintain the role of fire and end up with something more like this? Or do we want to let things play their course um, and end up with this? And it's really about our values and what we want, right? So there's a time when we thought, hey, fire's really bad, let's put them all out. And that worked for a while until it didn't, and even though we try, we end up with this anyways. So what do we want to do here? I guess I would just offer up that I think there's a question we have to ask ourselves, which is whether or not we want to suppress fire in the way we've been doing things uh, for a long time now that are not working anymore. Or do we want to try something different and maybe try to restore and maintain the role of fire in these systems? Currently, there are 4.2 million acres um, in Oregon and Washington that we identify in this red here as being in need of disturbance restoration. And that means they're at risk. Um, at risk meaning if a fire plays itself out in this sort of so-called natural state, although I would argue it's not really a natural state anymore because we have removed the natural disturbance from it, so therefore it's not natural now. But say we just let fire play its role, there's a high risk involved in that. So um, pulled this data, actually this was from last Friday, uh, from the U.S. Forest Service for Oregon, Washington. And um, one thing we know for sure is that there's about one and a half million acres that's planned, ready to be burned, but needs to be burned. And I'll talk more about why that's not happening more than it is. Because if you look at these numbers, the grand total for the past three, four years and this is including mechanical surrogates, grazing, herbicide application, other things that are not really burning but are sort of approximating some of the effects of fire. That's still, that's 1 million, you know, 1.4 million acres total. But if you look at the numbers for how much of the actual burning that's happening, um, it's not meeting it. It's not meeting the need. It's, it's really missing the mark. And if you look at back at some of the things that have already been burned, they're going to need to be burned again. You don't just solve the problem with one entry of fire. If you think about those returns that I showed you, like after 60, 80 years, you get one entry of fire, you're turning the clock back a little bit, but you gotta keep going back in to keep turning the clock back. It doesn't happen with one entry. So these numbers are encouraging, they're getting there, and one thing I'm gonna point out here is that the 2018 totals don't include some of their um, data entry, so they're still getting their data entry in, and so I gotta give the Forest Service credit this year. They were burning a lot uh, for the spring to the credit of uh, leadership in the regional office who are really making good things happen. And so I want to give them credit even though I'm also questioning why they're not doing more. And um, to also point out on this disturbance restoration need, which was research um, from the Nature Conservancy and the U.S. Forest Service as well as um, other researchers from universities and the Fire Lab, they're looking at all these different needs for restoration, and this is 
on uh, forested land. Um, so this isn't including like any east side or west side forest. This is all east side dry fire adapted forest. And the only reason that Southwest Oregon is included is because that is pretty much the same in terms of fire frequency as the east side of the Cascades. A lot of people don't know that, but the Klamath Siskiyou are just as fire frequent as the pine forests around Bend and east of the Cascades. So they're included. In and there's actually more red, which is the bad. There's way more red in Southwest Oregon than anywhere else. Um, so the idea that west of the Cascades is cool and wet and never sees fire and east of the Cascades is fire frequent is not quite true, um, especially when you consider that part of the state as well as what happened last year, last summer with all the fires we had on the west side. So um, talking a little bit more about what's happening, um, where is fire happening? Where is controlled burning happening? Why isn't more of it happening? Now, um, I will say that in the Pacific Northwest, and this is the upper left-hand um, map, by the way, this is based on survey data that was taken um, through a, a, um, a survey that was conducted by the Coalition of Prescribed Fire Councils and the National Association of State Foresters. So this is survey-based data, um, not something they pulled from reports. And what it shows is that the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, and Washington are actually burning acres that are more aligned with the southeast where fire is known to be um, very much prevalent at the human hand, more so almost than um, so-called natural wildfires. Um, you also see that in the lower left-hand corner that prescribed fire acres are trending up in Oregon and that's the only place on the west coast where that's the, ha that's the case. California's acres are going down. Um, and then we see in Oregon and Washington, Idaho and California, we're the only state or we're, we're a state that's showing way more acres burned than the others. So we're the only state trending up. Um, I think we're doing great. So um, kudos, but what is getting in the way of us getting more done? Uh, I like to say that if I could have one superpower, it would be to control the weather so I could get more burning done. But I don't include that with a little flame mark because you can only control what you can control. Can't control the weather, unfortunately. So what are the other things? Take out that 40%. Well, capacity is 18% of our challenge. Just not having the ability, the capacity, the people, the resources, the engines, the water handling, all the stuff to implement a burn. So that's 18%. Next up is smoke management. And Oregon actually just went through a revision of its smoke management plan that will hopefully open up some windows for us to do some more burning and get more good fire on the land. So that's good. And then we've got liability insurance, permitting and legal resources, public perception, population growth, Cooley boundary, et cetera. So I got the big flame there because that's really what I'm focusing on, although I do work with the Smoke Management Review Committee on policy issues as well. But building capacity is really what I'm focusing on here today um, as far as one of the opportunities that we have. So one of my colleagues challenged me to create a graphic to try to explain the sort of um, nesting of partnerships, the networking of different entities um, to support one another. And the foundation is in the tribes, the regional fire management partnerships, and the work of the collaboratives. And that includes entities like the Watershed Council. Um, next up, I'd, I'd highlight the state fire management councils, the state prescribed fire councils. Um, their work is huge in terms of uh, connecting, especially national level, regional and national level work, and that local level work. Um, leading up from there, cooperative burning across the Pacific Northwest. We've been really working a lot in Washington and with Washington across the boundaries there fire adapted communities and the prescribed fire training exchange program, which I'll talk more about. Um, and then the indigenous people's burning network, coalition prescribed fire councils, which is a nonprofit that um, basically uh, allows all the councils to have a voice with one voice at a national level. Um, and then the national inter international prescribed fire community in general, there's a network of the fire adapted communities and the fire learning network. So all of these, entities are part of how we integrate um, to meet the intent of the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy, generally called just the Cohesive Strategy. So that strategy put into action is really recognizing that fire doesn't care about the boundaries we have. We draw these lines, we say this is our property lines. Fire burns right across them. 
So why don't we manage fires as on fire's terms, not ours? Because we say stop there, it doesn't stop there. It just goes where it wants. So we should be working together more is the idea here. Uh, the Prescribed Bar Council started in 1975 in uh, southern Florida. And the reason they started was because private landowners said, by golly, I have a right to burn my land, to manage my land. And out west, that's not as common of a concept, but in the south, it's the real deal. And burning is good for so many reasons, but really, it's the most cost-effective tool they have at their disposal, and it's essential. Um, prescribed burning never really ended in the southeast. Um, even during the time period of fire suppression, uh, really being at the front of all the work that we had been doing with fire management, prescribed fire kept going in the southeast. So no surprise, that's where it came from. Where it shows in 1989, that's when really the council started to take hold because there were three in Florida at that point. But once the actual coalition formed, um, which was in 2007, they shot up. They went from like five councils to 30-something. And actually, I'll just go to my next graphic, which, um, which shows that. So it was as of 2018, um, these are the states that have established councils. We don't have any states that are trying to develop them as of right now, um, but there's been efforts in Idaho and Montana that have kind of fallen through. They might try again at some point. But most of the United States has councils now. Um, the Oregon and Washington councils with which I work um, each have missions which are slightly different. But the idea is to protect and, and conserve and, and, and really provide a venue for practitioners, people who regulate air quality, people who deal with burn permitting, all the folks that have a stake in prescribed fire have an avenue to communicate with each other and work together. So that's really the idea behind the um, prescribed fire councils. Um, we had a joint meeting this year, which was really great. Um, our states are very different. As you, you saw, you know, Oregon's doing a lot of burning, but Washington's doing a lot of policy work, and their Fire Adapted Communities Network is amazing. So we got together to learn from each other and to try to build some, some bridges to try to work together and support each other and help each other out. It was a great meeting. And actually, I, Riley was there, and that's part of how I ended up here, I think. Hey. <laughs> So uh, I will just brag up the partnerships, which um, are largely independent of me, but which I get to dip my toe in a fair amount. The uh, Southern Oregon Forest Restoration Collaborative and the Ashland Forest Resiliency Project um, is a great example of how communities have come together to overcome that environment where uh, lawsuits, punitive approaches, finger pointing, um, and more contentious approaches to land management were overcome through collaboration. Um, so now they have a 10-year project um, in the six, uh, 7,600 acres of the watershed involving um, mostly mechanical removal initially, but now we're in the phase of prescribed burning. And wow, is that challenging. And in that landscape, smoke management is number one because everything flows right into Ashland at night. So when they try to burn, they smoke out Ashland. So it's a real challenge there, but we're working on finding ways to inform communities and empower them with different alternatives to how to protect themselves because it's a real thing as somebody who's sensitive or who's sick, like my mom, gets smoke in their house. That's real. So we have to attend to that. So that's one of the things we've been working on is how to, how to reach out to people and make sure they have tools and information to protect themselves from smoke, whether it's a wildfire or a prescribed fire. Uh, the, East Mount, the East Side Restoration Strategy Blue Mountain Forest Partnership and the Cohesive Strategy Group based in the Blue Mountains. Um, they've got some great stuff going out there, similar project in the watershed of La Grande up towards Anthony Lakes where they're doing cross-boundary work on Oregon Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife administered lands, private lands, Forest Service lands, um, cross-boundary, and they're gonna start doing some burning soon in that landscape, as well as pretty much the entire Malheur National Forest um, just being planned and burned at a rate that is way beyond anything that's been done in the past. And again, same thing where the, the cohesion and the collaboration and working across the boundaries is really what's making that happen. Um, Central Oregon Fire Management Services, the place I work, 
near and dear to my heart. It goes from the Columbia River all the way down to Klamath County, from the Cre Cascade Crest out to Burns. It's a huge area. Um, they have been doing collaboration and work across boundaries since before it was cool, um, for real. And they decided to enter into um, joint work through their interagency dispatch center a long time ago. They got a bunch of agreements in place years before anybody was doing it so that they could more seamlessly help each other out and exchange resources and get burning done together. And I will tell you on the Deschutes and Ochico, um, they burn like they fight fire. They're incredibly aggressive, they're very productive. Last time I checked, they were claiming 26% of the Oregon and Washington acres burned. So um, really a place to look to as far as an example. Um, but a place I'm really looking forward um, to seeing what happens in, and it's on almost more of a cutting edge in some ways, is the South Central Oregon Fire Management Partnership. Um, they've been securing a lot of grant money through um, state and private forestry to do work on private lands as well as on the Fremont Wyneba National Forest and at the Nature Conservancy Saikan Marsh Preserve. So we have a bunch of cross-boundary work um, happening down there where we're burning as though the boundaries don't matter. We have equal authority on each other's land because we've negotiated a bunch of agreements. So it's not the fun part of the job, but you do it up front, you get a lot of stuff in writing, manage risk and liability, um, outline whose responsibilities are what and what authorities um, each entity has. And then all of a sudden these doors open up. And so that's really what they've been getting ready for. And I think the doors are starting to open. So look, looking forward to seeing how that goes. Um, and then this is really the heart of my work. Um, fourth generation Willamette Valley resident. And um, I see my work as largely in this part of the state returning it to what my ancestors encountered when they got here, which was a lot different than what we see today. This partnership is, um, is amazing. We have 10,000 acres across the Willamette Valley that's under conservation, and those are in tiny little checkerboards. I mean, the Willamette Valley is almost all privately owned. So to take care of that 10,000 acres of tiny little postage stamps checkerboarded across the valley is a labor of love. You don't do it because of the pace and scale of large forest restoration. You do it because you love that checker spot butterfly, the Taylor's checker spot, or in the case of most of my work, Defender's Blue Butterfly and the lupin upon which it depends. And those are things that you can only do through partnership. If we were to act independently and not work with these other entities, we'd never get our work done. Um, and this, I think this slide really shows the power of partnerships to that end. So here you see over the years, you know, one acre, six acre, I mean, six acre years. Oh my gosh, I'd be so sad if I were to claim that now, right? So you see the Rivers to Ridges partnership was established in the South Willamette Valley in 2003 and then boom, the acres start going up. And now here we are, you know, we don't see, it's rare to see less than a 300 acre year. And even last year, um, 2017, when the last thing I wanted to do is put smoke into my hometown of Eugene, Oregon after last summer, believe me. And I got plenty of crap from people for doing it two weeks after the smoke had cleared. But we had to do it, and we did, and the smoke didn't really impact anybody comparatively. Um, smoke from a grass fire is not the same as smoke from um, a wildfire in the timber. So um, we didn't have a lot of issues, thankfully. Um, but we lost a good couple weeks of burn windows as a result. Um, but regardless, the point being that in the 31 years that we've been burning in the South Willamette Valley and the Rivers to Ridges uh, project area, the majority of the acres have come about um, since we formed our partnership and started sharing responsibilities. And that amounts to I will do notifications one year and somebody else will do the permit with Lane Regional Air Protection Agency and then someone else is going to coordinate all of the information into an Excel spreadsheet that we all have available. And so we all throw down and help each other out and it makes our jobs easier because if we don't do it that way. We all do all of those things for ourselves. And it doesn't take that much more to do it for everybody. Um, it's a lot easier to share the responsibilities than it is to take them on individually. Um, so now I'm gonna shift gears and talk about the prescribed fire training exchange. This is the workforce development part of my talk. Um, the TREX triangle, as you guys could probably tell, we love triangles in fire, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> the TREX triangle um, is treatments. That means burning anchors, getting good fire in the right place at the right time for the right reasons. 
It's getting training. Um, and then it's outreach. And I'll tell you a little more about what each of those mean. Um, so this is now, an, it's the 10-year anniversary of the training exchange program. And so since uh, that time in 2008 when it started, we have been building local capacity for safer fire. That's an issue in a lot of areas. And as you saw in one of my earlier slides, capacity is a huge issue. That's something we really need to work on. So we're building that capacity. We're helping communities become more fire adapted, tr trying to help people learn how to live with fire in a different way and hopefully better than they have in the past. Bringing together diverse crews. This is hugely important. Um, in fire, we uh, tend to align with uh, groups and somewhat identify, but we need to also remember to open up to different ways of doing things and talking to and working with people that are different than us. So we do that at Trex. Um, it's by nature. We just end up bringing people from different places together. We give participants hands-on experience with appropriate fire, and that's ecologically and uh, culturally appropriate fire. In some places, fire is really a cultural thing as much as, as anything, um, and so it's important to account for that. We support interagency cooperation. Um, we integrate traditional burning practices into treks. And then the, the big thing is that there are bottlenecks in the workforce development program and prescribed burning. And so we help work through those bottlenecks by providing opportunities. Um, it's supported through an agreement which is uh, promoting ecosystem resilience and uh, fire adapted communities together. And this is a cooperative agreement between the Nature Conservancy, the Department of Interior Agencies, and the U.S. Forest Service. So we all put into that one pot. And then the Fire uh, Learning Network, which is basically an entity of the Nature Conservancy, um, uses that money for fire adapted communities, that social and operational capacity for right fire, which is through treks, and then restoring and, and sustaining um, resilient landscapes so that we can all live with fire. Um, so the cohesive strategy for wildland fire management promotes the idea that we can successfully co-manage wildland fire if we cross-pollinate and we create an adaptive and a diverse experiential learning environment. And so we are modeling those principles through the outreach training and treatments and really trying to trans transform homogeneity on the landscape, which is a problem in fire, to heterogeneity, which is really the hallmark of resilient landscapes and landscapes that are resilient when it comes to fire. Um, this is the evolution of the Prescribed Fire Training Exchange Program since 2018. And it's amazing if you look at how much it has diversified in terms of um, the participant diversity and the, the landscapes that are being burned. So it started off as mostly grassland burning in Nebraska and Texas, and it has evolved to really concentrate heavily in Northern California and Oregon on the West Coast. So we've been able to sustain this program. Um, and last year we burned 18, over 18,000 acres. So it's pretty incredible to see how much it's grown over the years and to see it go from 68 participants to 569 from over 10 different um, backgrounds and entities. In Oregon, uh, we've been doing the Prescribed Fire Training Exchange Program since 2015. Uh, we've burned over 6,500 acres since the program began. We've had eight events, um, primarily in Ashland and Central Oregon. We also had one on the Umpqua last year, uh, based down in Glide. And we've had over 300 people from the United States, Mexico, Spain, Portugal, Canada, Germany, the United Kingdom, and also, I forgot to add, New Caledonia. Um, who knew, right? And um, so we have international participants, and all these folks come together to burn and learn together. And I can't tell you how much I've learned from people, especially the Spaniards. They're amazing uh, fire practitioners. So grateful to have that opportunity. Um, but additionally, I want to um, give some props to the tribes, especially in Northern California and the Indigenous Peoples Burning Network. The reason I have this slide up here is because last February, I was asked to um, burn boss and, and be the incident commander for the Yurok treks. And they said they wanted to do it in February. And I was like, okay, whatever. February, really? So I planned a trip to the Yucatan for 10 days right beforehand thinking they're going to reschedule, of course. Well, I checked the weather in the Yucatan. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to work. They're going to burn in February. And sure enough, I come home and two days later, I'm in my truck driving down to Wichipec to burn with these two amazing women, Margot Robbins and Elizabeth Azuz, who are um, 
So basket weavers and women in the Yurok tribe are the fire ecologists. They are the, the they're in charge of fire down there. And they started the Cultural Fire Management Council, which has started the community training for controlled burning to get family burning back into the hands of the people again. And they're the ones that said, and look down here, global temperature change by month. Let's burn in February. What's the month that's showing the most increase in global temperature change? It's February. So if you want to know what to do about climate change, talk to the tribes, because they're the ones who have the deepest history. We don't, we have science. They have deep cultural knowledge that's been passed down for generations, and they're paying attention to landscapes in a way that most of us aren't. So opening up windows, this is a huge opportunity, burning at times of year when we would not historically burn in our limited time frame of doing this work. Um, as I near the end of my talk, I can't help but um, talk up my program a little bit. So this is our um, controlled ecological burning in Oregon last year. Um, we led 1,830 acres. There was 25 acres that we assisted with. We did two treks events. We assisted a little bit with the third one, but we really only claimed two. And um, we had live fire research happening at our Saikan Marsh Preserve, which was amazing. We had um, fixed wing and drone aircraft with thermal cameras that were um, filming what we were doing so that they could validate fire models, um, which is just an incredible opportunity to work with people that were doing that kind of cutting edge, res cutting edge research. Um, we also did 280 acres at our Juniper Hills Preserve for the abatement of encroaching juniper that is really harming rangelands and grasslands um, east of the Cascades. Of course, we had our uh, Trex event on the Ochico, which is how we claim a lot of our acres there. Um, and then, of course, the Willamette Valley Program. Um, we led burns um, on our own preserves, as well as the Finley National Wildlife Refuge and um, Natural Resource Conservation Wetland Reserve Program easements on private land. So did a lot of work in the Willamette Valley despite the challenging fire season last year. And um, so as I close, it's a little bit somber, but um, I think it's hopeful too. And I have to mention this because um, I've lost someone on a wildfire. Um, and I know how much they cost, both in human life, ecological costs, and cost per acre. And I've never lost somebody, anyone burning, and that's my goal is to never have that happen. And I think that the statistics are in my favor because we can plan what we're doing. When we fight fire, we're reacting. But when we burn, we're planning. And um, I'm not saying that we plan everything out to where we know exactly what's going to happen, but we have a lot better idea when we conduct a controlled burn than we do when we're out uh, fighting a wildfire. And so I would just propose that um, we can live well with fire just like this guy Jack Shipley whose land we're burning. This is the way we should be living with fire is chilling while it's burning in the background, not running away from it. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. <laughs> What's that? Yes. I remember you. Yeah, this is a really good question. So the question is, knowing, especially if you live in the woods, and knowing that climate change is ch changing this environment, you can tell by how cured the grass is already, by the trees that are dying, all these other things that are changing. Our environment's changing really quickly. What do we do? Um, I wish I had an easy answer for you. <laughs> I think this is something that's in process, in progress. It has to do with you getting involved um, in the prescribed fire council is one example. Um, in other places, prescribed burn associations have formed where private landowners collectively get together and pool their resources, they enter into agreements, and then they basically help each other out. And I think that cooperative approach is really good. Um, you can offer up your land to Oregon Department of Forestry for training um, if they're willing to do it. Um, they may or may not, depending on what kind of funding they have that year, what kind of fire season they have. Um, they are tasked with, first and foremost, their job is to put fires out. 
they're here to protect land and they're funded combination of taxes that they pay directly and then the general fund. Um, and so it's, I can't make any commitment on of, of their resources. Um, you can always pay somebody to come and burn your land for you. Um, that can be rather cost prohibitive for a lot of landowners, depending on what kind of resources you have. You can pay a contractor to come do that for you. Um, but I would, I would definitely encourage a combination of talking to your neighbors about what their interest is. Because if you're just one landowner who wants to burn, that's one thing. But if you and your neighbors all want to burn, then you can get together and do it and share the liability. And the biggest challenge is in, if I light a fire on my land, what happens if it goes on my neighbor's land, right? That's the risk. I mean, you could probably accept the risk of something happening on your side of the fence because you decided to do it. But once it crosses the boundary, that's when you have real problems. So the, this is a model that has worked in other parts of the country. And I didn't talk about that here, but the prescribed burn associations, which are not the same as the council, they're landowner burn cooperatives. And they get grant money. They have a, uh, most of them have these burn trailers where they have a bunch of equipment and stuff that they've gotten. So if you can get money from Pheasants Forever, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, um, nonprofits that like to support and promote habitat. I'd say wildlife habitat development as a, as a key component of that is a way to get money, aside from risk reduction. Um, there is money out there in state and private forestry grants. Most of it's mechanical. So most of the work right now being done is hazard reduction and taking advantage of those grants first. Because one thing is that a lot of lands are not necessarily ready to receive fire. They've got too much time and accumulation of material. This they really need a mechanical reduction and then you can come reintroduce fire. So trying to take advantage of opportunities from the state to do thinning and fuels reduction first or doing it on your own will make you a lot more um, successful in competing for getting money or, or being able to position yourself to get some assistance. Did you try 911 first? Oh, okay. Okay. So, due diligence on the part of anyone burning is to make sure 911 knows. Every time I burn, 911 knows they've got the location. That way, when someone calls, they're like, oh, yeah, we already know about that. Thanks for letting us know, but they've already called us. So, I'd say. Just don't hesitate, just call 911. Because honestly, if, if, if whoever's burning hasn't let them know anyways, maybe they need to hear from them so that they let 911 know next time. I mean, you know, if you're gonna set fires on purpose like I do for a living, you gotta tell a lot of people about it beforehand. Well, that signs are good too. I have a, I have signs that I put up. Um, you know, I tell people what's going on. Um, you know, and some of this is I've been trained in this business. You know, I've been doing it for a long time, um, so I have all these best practices. But I'm not going to tell you other people are using those best practices. And actually, they need to be educated because it's all our responsibility to communicate. Because it's a, this is no joke. That fire. I mean, we need. I like I'm saying, we need to be burning more. But at the same time, fire is only getting more hazardous and more crazy. <laughs> and so call it in, treat it like an emergency unless you know otherwise. And I don't care if it's fire season or not because fire season is just, I mean, it's a delineation in time that yes, official now we're in fire season and restrictions go in place. That doesn't mean there's not fire hazard outside of that time frame. There is. 
Um, but I, I understand your concern. It's, it's a public service issue that um, I wish I could solve, but you're legitimate in your concerns. Just call 911. I have done mm -hmm. it myself. Um, which which statistics are you referring to? Oh, um, okay, so the one that I put up um, where it was 4.2 million acres at risk and 1.4 million acres planned, that was Forest Service specific. Um, BLM's a little trickier because there's the checkerboarded landscapes and then there's a lot of the landscapes out east which are Actually, the BL there's more BLM land that has a fire frequent problem where it burns too often because of annual grass invasions. So um, there's actually a whole effort in the BLM to fight fire more aggressively in um, rangeland environments because of that. Um, so there, I would not prescribe um, sort of wholesale that we just need to burn everything more. In fact, some things need to burn less, and that would be the case for the BLM, and that's probably why I don't talk about it as much because it's a lot more nuanced and complicated of a problem. Um, but suffice to say, there are places that probably historically burn every 25 to 75 years that now burn like every three years because they have their native um, plant community has been displaced and it's been replaced by in, um, annual grasses such as cheatgrass, uh, Ventonata dubia, and also known as North Africa grass, Medusa head rye, and they are continuous. So they create a horizontal field bed that then burns um, much more frequently and at larger scales than if the native plant community of bunch grasses, which are se separated by a lot of bare dirt, those areas would not as burn as frequently or as large of an extent. So a lot of BLM lands have a different problem. Yes, and fi that's a good one. Right, so you can use fire in the spring to control the invasive annual grasses like Medusa head, that's right. Um, and I don't know how, as m how much of the that they're doing these days, but they have in the past done a fair amount of it. And um, I wouldn't say, I'd say the BLM is burning less now than they have in the past, primarily because most of their funding for hazardous fuels reduction has been um, reallocated to aggressive fire suppression in rangelands with invasive annual grass problems, which is unfortunate because they have a lot of land down in Southwest Oregon that really needs a lot of fire and they struggle. That's actually one of the places we're helping them a lot at our treks, in our treks program is in the Ashland treks. We go out to the Applegate Valley and help the BLM burn because they don't have um, as much help. So the question there was about um, why um, BLM land was, or whether BLM land was included in my statistics or not. I needed to repeat that question for um, sake of recording here. So thank you. Yes. Yeah, there's, um, for those of you who haven't noticed, we have, um, so to start over, to repeat the question, he's, he's asking about all the dug fur that are dying um, in the Umpqua and the Willamette Valley and, and whether or not that contributed to last season's fires. Um, so most of that is due to an, um, a combination of drought and then the flat-headed fur borer, which is taking advantage of weakened trees. And um, a lot of those trees are succumbing obviously and a lot of them are still standing um, from my observations most of that is fairly low elevation it's not as much up in the higher elevations and most of the fires from last summer were higher elevation fires so they weren't there wasn't ex but I think it's coming so it may not have happened last year or that may not have overlapped but you're basically identifying what I think is a huge problem is going to be a huge problem in the future which is the amount of dead fuel that we have standing right now that's going to fall over and become more of it's still available now but those fuels are going to become more available as they hit the ground and um, I, I think particularly in the South Hills um, there's there's some real probability out there for some problems in the future um, 
but I, I didn't see the, the overlap, but there probably was some in some areas. So I'm, he, he's asking if I anticipate a bad fire season this summer. I never get asked that question, so let me, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I always start with one thing, which is I've seen really crazy dry, dry years that would be really bad that didn't end up having bad fire seasons because there were no ignitions. Um, so if conditions are ripe and dry and, and everything's really receptive, if you don't have starts, you don't have fire. So if everyone behaves themselves and handles their fires properly and we don't get lightning, then you know we can have a really, really quiet and very dry um, summer, and that's, that's happened before. Um, one thing to note about last year was that um, those huge snowpack years typically produce more lightning. And so when we have lower snowpack, we can receive less lightning. That said, we had um, a lot of precipitation received in the Great Basin, and I have heard that that is likely to impact us, that lightning was likely to come from inland um, because of that. So we could see that many more starts anyway. Certainly the fuel conditions are prime for large fire growth. We've already seen over 2,000 acres in June, you know, outside of Three Rivers subdivision near Culver. Um, so that to me says that we're, you know, we're there. That's a big fire for June anywhere in Oregon, um, but particularly over there. Um, so I'd say that if we get the ignitions, we will see fire, um, we'll see large fire growth. So they're asking about the scientific explanation for why there's more lightning after high snowmelt. So or the high snowpack. So what happens is, and this is particularly when the snowpack is followed by high temperatures, so the rapid um, evapotranspiration part of it, or the evaporation of the, um, the snow as it melts, basically creates, it like basically is sending moisture up into the air that creates um, clouds that form lightning. So you basically just see more of that moisture material going up in the air that then, um, creates lightning from thunderstorms. And there's, I'm sure, um, way more, de that's a very simplified explanation. There's probably more details to that, um, but that's it in a nutshell. Yes. Yeah, there, there's a, some research that recently came out about this, um, which there's been interpretation kind of both directions on. Uh, so depending on which camp you're listening to, the if you want to hear the industry side of it, it's that road systems management slash treatment and appropriate and quick response will enable you to put a fire out. And so that means that managed forests are better because you can get to things more quickly and the slash has been treated and you're not just like leaving it out there. The counter argument is that um, young plantations are more susceptible to fire and if you think about canopy base height for example, so the way fire starts is it's on the surface and then it travels up through ladder fuels to get into the crowns of the trees. Old trees have a long ways to go in the ladder to get up to the crown so they don't have as many ladder fuels. And so the argument on that side of things is that these older forests are more resilient. It takes a lot more to get a crown fire going in an old forest than it does in a young one. Um, but the industry side will say, well, you guys, your f the fires are coming from the unmanaged side. And then, you know, the forest service set might say, no, the forest, the fires are because of the managed side. There's fingers pointing both directions, but it's just more complicated than saying one or the other. Um, I think that multiple age classes are important on a landscape and that historically fires would have created these plantations naturally to some extent. So I don't think we can really say one way or the other that it's that simple of a story. I will say that um, having more fire on the landscape on our terms is one thing that will reduce the problem regardless of whether it's an old forest or a young one. Yes.
Are there species of trees that a homeowner can plant that are going to be more resilient during climate change? Oh man, that's a tough one. It depends on where you are, but um, I would like to refer back in history to answer that question to what was here um, when Native Americans were managing the landscape in the, in the Willamette Valley with fire. So fire controlled the encroachment of Douglas fir down into oaks and into prairies. And oaks can survive a fairly wide range of conditions. They can survive conditions that are really wet and cold, and they can survive conditions that are really hot and dry. And Douglas fir are much more finicky. They don't like it too wet. They don't like it too dry. Um, so in terms of the Goldilocks thing, you know, it's like I think of it that way. So oaks are really the trees that do well under a lot of different conditions, and they're very stable. They're very fire resistant and fire resilient. And um, so I'd say promoting oaks, but I think there's other trees. You know, hardwoods in general are probably going to be um, better than um, a lot of our conifer species here but it also depends on what elevation you're at. And we have a lot of really subtle ecotones in the Willamette Valley on the order of even just a couple feet. So the bottom of the Willamette flo Valley floor had very few trees in it historically. It was burned fairly often. And then the oak savanna and oak woodland areas didn't have a lot of conifers in them either. And most of us live in places that historically did not have very many fir trees in them. And we all think that this is this very forested, dense valley floor but it wasn't historically. So what we're seeing right now is mother, I like to say mother nature correcting for our mistakes because we kept fire out of the system. We actually planted dug firs in places they don't belong and um, now they're dying. And so we kind of have to make peace with that and recognize that they probably weren't meant to be here in the abundance that they are now anyways. And looking at things like oaks would be my recommendation for this area. But depending on where you are, it's very different. We're done. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.